So we're here tonight. Uh, to, this is the fourth fourth meeting that we have had on trying to address <clears throat> this affordable housing and this rental situation that we find ourselves in in Marin County and throughout really throughout the Bay Area. Some of the recent successes that our board has had is um, acquisition and preservation of affordable housing, a, le a very successful landlord partnership program, which I think staff will get into more detail on that, source of income protection ordinance that we have passed, <clears throat> and development code amendments. So tonight we are going to ha hear suggestions of other things that we can do that we have mentioned we want to hear more about, and we're ready to start doing that now. So I'm going to turn it over to Lily Thomas or Brian Crawford. Well, <laughs> since Brian. you just did such a great job in teeing up this item, um, I'm going to uh, shorten my comments even more so just to reiterate that the purpose of the, this workshop this evening is twofold. One is to uh, give you an update on the progress of a number of the housing policy initiatives your board adopted or initiated uh, last uh, 2015, uh, going into early 2016. We've made progress on a number of those. We'll give you a brief overview of that information. And then more importantly, we'd like to devote much of our time this evening to discussing the several uh, policy options that we're seeking direction from your board on. Uh, our, our staff is poised to continue working on those, but at this point uh, we feel it's important to get your input on your interest in moving forward on those, as well as any insights, observations, issues, questions that you may have that would help inform our discussions going forward. I'd also like to point out that we've been working with the board subcommittee on this, uh, comprised of Supervisors Connolly and Katie Rice. And for the three or four policy initiatives that we're seeking direction on, uh, it's also important to keep in mind we're not asking you to adopt any definitive actions or ordinance tonight rather than to signify your interest or not to move forward, get your insights, and then we'll continue working on those with the board subcommittee with the idea that we would be returning to your board through uh, future hearings to discuss and focus in on some of these uh, specific initiatives that will be on the table this afternoon, or this evening, rather. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lily Thomas of our staff, who are also joined by Debbie LaRue of our housing program as well. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, board. Um, <clears throat> as Brian mentioned, we're going to give you a brief update on some of our successes but uh, and where we are, we are on the work plan. This work plan came out of a series of workshops that you held in 2015. Um, you adopted a work plan in 2016 with the intention to um, preserve housing affordability and provide some stability in the rental housing market. And so some of the successes that you've had in that venue include the acquisition and preservation strategy, which is focusing on acquiring existing housing and ensuring that it remains affordable, making sure that those tenants are not displaced and that it has long-term deed restrictions on it. We've done that since the spring of 2016. We've done two properties, including the Piper Court Apartments, um, family housing in the city of Fairfax. 27 homes were preserved as affordable housing, as well as the Ocean Terrace Apartments in Stinson Beach, which are, there were eight homes preserved, including four of which were occupied by Section 8 tenants who were at risk of displacement if that property was sold and rents were raised beyond what could be paid for through the Section 8 program. Um, as you mentioned, the, the Marin Housing's Landlord Partnership Program um, with much leadership and support from Supervisor Connolly has been a, an amazing success. Mm -hmm. The Housing Authority has brought on 55 new landlords into the program which has increased the access to housing for families and individuals who have Section 8 vouchers. And that's been done through um, funding that the county allocated for financial incentives, including um, loss uh, vacancy control or vacancy protection, a loss mitigation pool, and security deposits for tenants. <coughs> Um, a source of income protection ordinance that your board adopted last November is being used as a model by communities around the Bay Area. 
um, Berkeley recently used it as a model and adopted it, as did Santa Clara County, and Oakland is considering a similar ordinance. So your board has proven leadership in that, in that role uh, around that ordinance to protect folks who have Section 8 um, vouchers from um, discrimination. Um, your board also adopted a number of development code amendments, which included some provisions to make it easier to um, develop accessory dwelling units, formerly known as second units, and junior accessory dwelling units to provide some infill housing in our communities. <coughs> so however, despite those successes, as you may have read in today's IJ, rents are continuing to increase. Um, a rent, average rent in the city of San Rafael is over $2,400 for a one bedroom and over $3,000 for a two bedroom. Um, so as we are asking you for direction on some of these policy options, I ask you to remember the families, seniors, and folks with disabilities who are struggling to remain in our community. Um, so as we have mentioned, the Landlord Partnership Program has been a success. They have exceeded a number of their goals um, in the first year and, and some of their second year goals also. And we are, the Housing Authority and staff are recommending that we reallocate some funding that was in their contract for the voluntary rent guidelines that we'll talk about next and use those funds instead for, to augment the loss um, um, the loss mitigation, the um, security deposits, and the vacancy protections so that there will be additional funding in that contract. The voluntary rent guidelines was initially considered as an alternative to rent stabilization as a way to address um, some of our um, rapidly rising rents by asking um, the landlord community to voluntarily agree to limit rent increases to a specified percentage. And after a series of um, meetings and uh, with a number of landlords, there uh, no specific amount could be agreed upon that would be both have wide applicability so that a, a lot of landlords were participating and yet have a significant effect with tenants. And so. Um, staff is recommending, um, along with the Housing Authority, that we delete that program and instead consider some mandatory, a mandatory mediation as a way, as an alternative to address um, some escalating rents. And the way that program could work is that it could be structured that if um, there was a rent increase over a specified amount, um, that landlords and tenants be required to sit down it with a mediation and know the, what, it, what came out of the mediation would not be a binding, but it, would, it may offer a place where landlords and tenants could sit down and have a conversation with a neutral third party facilitator um, to hopefully come up with some alternative or you know, phased in rent increase or something else. Um, this would require additional staffing to, uh, or an outside um, contract to augment what's currently offered through the mediation services and the DA's office. So we're asking you whether we should consider and move forward with this and look into the uh, more specificity about the resources that would be involved. Um, a just cause for eviction ordinance would prevent no fault evictions of responsible tenants providing them with greater security and stability. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's been used around the Bay Area as a tool to address displacement in our rental community. Um, it, it wouldn't address, a uh, just cause would not address um, or um, affect rent increases but um, it could, landlords could retain their right to terminate or evict based on non-payment of rent, property damage, or other lease um, violations. In addition, it could be structured so that to address local needs. For example, if a family member was gonna move in or the owner wanted to occupy the property themselves, those are often um, exemptions in a just cause ordinance. Is my mic not working? Okay, sorry. 
um, in addition, if we proceed with the just cause ordinance, it could be um, structured to meet some of the unique needs that we've heard about in Marin. For example, an ordinance could um, be structured to apply where there's code violations, documented code violations. Um, it could be used in the cases that we hear about where a property has been owned by somebody or family for a long time. The ownership is turned over often um, a corporate landlord is purchasing that property, um, leases are terminated, and tenants um, move out, and there's some remodels that are done. So in those cases, a just cause could be structured to include some relocation costs um, to for, the, for the tenants. Um, and it could also address some equity and discrimination concerns among our immigrant population that we've heard about. Um, and a as a reminder, this is the third time that your board has considered just cause for evictions, um, in beginning in October 2015, and this is currently in the work plan scheduled for February to August of 2017, and we're asking you to provide us with some direction on whether to do um, public outreach, especially with our landlord and tenant groups, and to work with our subcommittee on um, whether or not to proceed with a and proceed with an ordinance for your consideration. Um, the second unit amnesty program was intended to reduce some barriers to bring in unpermitted um, accessory dwelling units um, to legalize them. However, with the new legislation that was adopted at the state level, um, we feel that um, the amnesty program is no longer necessary and staff is recommending that we delete that program um, septic constraints um, continue to be a barrier in West Marin, and staff is working on that through um, another um, venue. Um, the housing overlay designation was adopted in the 2007 countywide plan mm -hmm. as a tool to promote and encourage development of new um, affordable workforce housing and in infill sites. However, since 2007, in the last 10 years, none of the housing overlay sites have developed. And in our housing element, we have a program that um, requires us to consider this program and look at ways that we could, um, you know, look at ways that we could amend the program to ensure that it is um, facilitating new construction <coughs> of housing. And if there's any amendments that are needed, that we would go and that would require a countywide plan amendment. Um, a, a local a working group was convened to provide us with some expert recommendations about what could, um, what modifications could be done, what amendments could be done to the <coughs> HOD policy to encourage and help get some more affordable housing developed on those sites. <coughs> and um, there are two main recommendations included amending the program so that um, housing would be required on those sites. Currently, um, the site could develop as commercial only, and so amending that to require housing similar to the mixed-use policy, and to consider doing um, specific plans where planning was done up front on a site um, as a way of reducing some of the uncertainty for a housing provider and for the community on those sites. So we're asking your staff to, uh, we're asking you to direct us to continue to work with the subcommittee and to schedule a workshop, uh, most likely this fall, to consider that program. So uh, here's a brief summary of our recommendations, and that concludes my um, presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have before we hear public comment. Okay, <coughs> I'm with you to my right. You need to put questions. Okay, go ahead. Find them. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Um, on the mandatory uh, mediation, you mentioned rent increases. Is that the only mediation we'd be doing, or does it include other things? It, it could include other th other things. Um, the intent was that we were looking at it in the context of uh, an alternative <coughs> to the voluntary rent guidelines, which were structured around in rent increases. But we could look at it at other provisions Thank if you. we move forward with that program. And then, as far as acquisitions, have we identified any other potential at this point? There's um, two properties that we're working on with our partners, with the Housing Authority, the City of San Rafael, and the Marine Community Foundation. OK. 
Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Supervisor. Yeah, just, uh, um, Lily, thank you. And I'm, um, we've, uh, I've obviously been participating in the subcommittee, so you heard a lot of my comments and questions in committee, but I thought it'd be important to clarify of our different, the different programs that we've put in place and the ones we're considering, um, the geographic area they apply to, differentiating between unincorporated and um, broader Marin, and also the types of housing that they apply to, if that's um, appropriate for, for the program. For instance, on our acquisition and preservation program, we, um, we're happy to cooperate within, you know, inside city jurisdictions or without. So if you just want to walk through the land okay. park, all of those. So as you mentioned, the acquisition and preservation is a program that applies both in the unincorporated and in the city limits. Um, a, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, your board um, to made a decision to use housing trust funds within cities and towns um, if there's local support for that project. And so in that way, we are also looking for acquisition and preservation opportunities anywhere in the county, so not limited to unincorporated. Mm -hmm. Um, the landlord partnership is similar. Um, those funds can be used anywhere in the county. Um, the housing authority is, you know, actively recruiting landlords both within cities and within the unincorporated part of the county. Um, then more policy, um, the voluntary rent guidelines, I guess, would have been primarily in the unincorporated part of the county. Um, and, and programs like the mandatory mediation, the just cause, the second unit amnesty, and the HOD all are limited within the unincorporated part of the county. And then for the mandatory mediation um, or the just cause, to what kinds of housing would that apply to? All rental housing? Yes. Um, both Single family residential? Yes. Typically, um, mandatory mediation and just cause apply to all housing. So. In that case, it applies, it's not limited to, you know, folks who have Section 8 or people who are low income. It or mul or multifamily? It applies to both single family and multifamily. Okay. And then the source of income protection ordinance? The source of income protection ordinance, again, it's with it just within the unincorporated part of the county, but um, we have worked with cities and towns, and there's a number of cities and towns that are looking <coughs> at adopting similar ordinances, and our hope is that those be um, adopted throughout the county so that there's some uniformity and applicability of those type of ordinances throughout the county. Thank you. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Question, question, mm -hmm. Supervisor Collins. Yeah, just a few, and thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, needless to say, we're gratified that the Landlord Partnership Program has really taken off, and <coughs> we look forward to continued success. I would personally endorse the move to provide the additional funding um, at this point. I think it would be put to good use. On the acquisition and preservation strategy, there has been some talk in the past um, in terms of going forward with that in perhaps recruiting some professional help um, as part of the strategy to go out and find um, possible acquisition um, sites. Ha has there been any additional thought on that? Yes, yeah, sorry, I skipped over that. That's okay. Um, the one of the things that we're considering, we have been lucky enough in the acquisition and preservation to work with um, realtors who have done this um, voluntarily. They've donated their time. And so we think that there's opportunity to continue that. So as far as identifying specific properties, we think we can do that through um, our partnerships and our, um, you know, working with local realtors. However, um, there is a thought that we could uh, benefit from having some more expertise around doing feasibility and pro formas, you know, doing budgets and establishing whether this project could be feasibly converted mm -hmm. um, before we've identified a, a nonprofit to take on the ownership. And so um, the county administrator's office and the Marin Community Foundation are working together to um, partner and hopefully hire somebody that the county and the foundation would, would work together on it on doing that feasibility analysis. Great. Um, one issue you mentioned, and we have heard about it uh, from the community, particularly the immigrant community um, in, our, in our outreach, and by the way, we're looking forward to a, a robust discussion tonight, um, all points of view, and then we already do have additional community meetings scheduled with both tenants and landlords going forward, so this is going to be an ongoing process. But what we have heard 
and you alluded to it was the issue of threats of eviction in situations where building standards are up, not up to code. Um, and so honing in on that, because after all, we want to come up with solutions to these issues, not exacerbate or, but where do things stand with building code enforcement in terms of what kind of resources the county can bring to bear on that for that yeah. kind of issue? Yeah, so in our environmental health division, we have a full-time staff member, um, and there may be additional resources in that program as well that conduct biennial housing inspections of all apartment buildings that have three or more units. And, um, and they look for a wide variety of code violations, both within and outside the, uh, the units themselves. There are about 650 apartment buildings that are subject to that program, roughly 86, 8,700 units involved. Um, on a, a typical year, looking at some past data for 2015, by way of example, um, our staff identified roughly 1,000 housing code violations, keeping in mind that some units had multiple code violations within the same unit. Um, and our staff works with the landlords to correct those as soon as possible. Some of them are corrected um, quickly on site during the actual inspection, the easy ones. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, some of the code violations involve um, more substantive uh, structural remodel and repair that include building permits. The time frame for correcting those can be weeks, perhaps even months. But the typical time frame for most of these code violations is within 30 to 45 days. And just so folks know, there are strong state laws on the books prohibiting retaliation um, in the face of complaints about habitability issues. But at the end of the day, how are those laws enforced? I mean, does the county play a role in that or is it legal aid, um, how, how can folks enforce their legal rights on that? The, the county through code enforcement, we don't have a role, the community development agency has no role in doing, um, in, you know, in addressing retaliatory evictions. It's my understanding that um, a tenant needs to find their own legal representation um, and that those, they <coughs> often prove difficult for um, a tenant to prove. The, the burden tends to be on the tenant to prove those. And just final point, um, going back to what you said, Lily. So in that case, for example, we're talking about unincorporated area, right? Correct. And so far, in terms of the source of income uh, ordinance that we passed, which is great to hear, is serving as a model, that's also currently unincorporated. Correct. But I do think we should do outreach to our cities and towns and on some of these um, issues that should be raised across the board and try to work with them to get similar ordinances. That's the goal. And staff has done it, has done some outreach. You know, um, Supervisor Arnold sent letters to all of the mayors around the, uh, of the cities. And, you know, the county has traditionally been the leader around housing policy that the the cities tend to kind of wait for the county to do it, um, to adopt those policies and then adopt them later. For example, the inclusionary policy that was adopted in 1980, the county was one of the first statewide jurisdictions to do that and then the cities did uh, at a later at a later date. So yes, that intent tends to be that the county is the leader on housing policy and cities and towns adopt later. Yeah, brief point of clarification regarding Supervisor Connolly's question on the housing code violations. The numbers that I provided are for the un, both the unincorporated county and most of the cities and towns, but the city of San Rafael and Nevada conduct their own housing code uh, inspections and handle their own uh, code compliance issues. Supervisor Rod. Yeah, just a follow up on the, um, because I'm really interested, I, I really want to understand what, how we are proposing or, or what any of these um, programs might do and Just Cause is a good one how that differs from what legal protections are already on the books. And it may be, as you say, that it's difficult to en enforce um, or to, for a tenant to actually pursue a retaliatory eviction. But I think that's, that's one of the things I need to understand is it, what's already law, uh, whether or not it's 
easy, difficult or not to pursue and to um, actually exercise and what, what the program would add to it and then where's the assurance that we could enforce the same or what would our mechanism be to enforce same. So that because there is, I, I was also reading about what, what tenant protections exist and I know that folks complain about um, concern around evictions if they bring up code violations or, you know, um, physical problems, safety issues with the, within the rental units they're occupying. Uh, uh, as um, Supervisor Connolly mentioned, there is already statewide protection for retaliatory evictions. So if somebody complains about code enforcement issue, um, there are protections. Um, I, I am not an expert on how difficult that is and you know, maybe we need to hear from somebody else on it, but my understanding is that it, it pr it's difficult for tenants to, um, to really um, use those, those current laws on, that are on the books and that one of the, you know, one of the specific issues that we've talked about is that people who are, who may be undocumented have a further concern around um, filing a complaint around code violations or, you know, concerns with conditions of the apartment because of their fear of both immigration status issues as well as eviction. And so having something that was more, had more broad applicability um, so that really the burden changes from um, th from the tenant having to prove it to the landlord just needing to give a reason for why that lease termination is happening. And I, I would like to make the point that I think that most landlords this would not apply to. Mm -hmm. Most landlords do screening and they have um, good relationships with their tenants. They're not, you know, terminating leases willy nilly. Um, and we're really, that this policy would most likely address a small subset of landlords um, and housing providers. There are also state laws that require minimum eviction notice periods as that you may be aware of that vary depending upon how long the uh, tenant has been in the unit. Uh, and I believe those minimum periods are extended for folks who have a Section 8 voucher. That, that's right. Uh, for a lease termination, it's if you've lived in a home for less than a year, it's 30 days. Um, if it's more than that, it's 60 days. And I believe that if you are a Section 8 participant, that it's 90 days. Madam President, can I ask yes. a follow-up mm -hmm. on that? One thing we asked um, Lily at, at the last hearing is, did we have any latitude to extend the notice period, either for evictions or or rent increase, um, and I know you did some research. Yeah, it's uh, um, it's we are actually preempted from extending those notices by state law. So state law specifically specifies the 30 days and 60 days, and uh, local communities are are preempted from extending those. Theoretically, um, through mediation or or some other mechanism, though, notice periods could be on the table. Is that right? Um, I don't think that notice period that that is specifically because it's it's specified in state law what they are we are not we can't do that you know I, I, I think that um, and we would have to be careful that if any mediation wasn't going to interfere with um, the deadlines and the timelines that are set out through an eviction process or through those noticing processes we'd have to be careful not to um, you know that there wasn't any conflict between them. Yeah, I think rather the, the, the period within which the eviction may or may not take place as a result of the mediation program would be a function of how efficiently or how quickly the mediation process takes place according to the local jurisdic jurisdiction's administration of that program as opposed to um, an eviction period being uh, expressly called out in that, that program or ordinance. And and if you need, if you'd like to ask more specific questions around that, County Council is here. That, that answer that. And I'll note um, a representative from the DA's mediation we're program. Just about that. We were just okay. going to call up yeah. there. <laughs> good. <laughs> good to so just, Yeah, good. Okay. Would you like to come up and add? Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Andy. <laughs> hmm. Where were you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a specific question you want me to address? You want to address the last? Issue. So uh, the DA's office does I have. If you could have frame it a little bit, Andy. There yep. may be other ways to answer that question, but I know that your office does landlord-tenant 
related issues mediation and i'm curious about whether an aspect of that is relates to retaliatory convictions there may be other things to say about what you're doing retaliatory evictions versus convictions yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, to, to address the specific question that was brought, uh, via mediation, we have actually uh, gotten landlords to agree to extend the, the uh, three-day eviction period. Uh, so you can, while, while you may not be able to legislate uh, what the state has already uh, expressed uh, express authority over uh, through mediation, any, any of the parties can stipulate to uh, extend deadlines. So we've, we've been successful in uh, getting landlords to extend deadlines uh, via stipulation, especially in, in regards to evictions. So where, where there may be a three-day uh, notice uh, to quit, uh, we have gotten landlords to give tenants uh, more time uh, for that process to uh, happen. But uh, I, I don't know if you wanted me to go into generally what uh, how we may able to assist in this process. I, I can do that right now. Why don't you do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so the DA's office has a no-cost voluntary mediation program. Uh, we've had it for quite some time now. Uh, typically it involves disputes involving marine consumers uh, or marine businesses. Uh, when we first started our program, we primarily uh, did uh, consumer business complaints. And when we incorporated the county's mediation services uh, approximately 10 years ago, we took on a more uh, general scope, including landlord-tenant issues, uh, HOA issues, neighbor disputes. Uh, so we, we have evolved in time to uh, be more broad-based than we originally started out to be. Uh, we also do, we have related duties involving doing, uh, conducting administrative hearings, uh, which I, I, as I looked at the program that you may be proposing, uh, an administrative hearing process may be uh, one of the options that you're looking at. So we do administrative hearings in regards to animal hearings. Uh, we are the, the county's designee as far as uh, adjudicating or putting on animal hearings. And animal hearings are hearings that are brought by a petition via animal services in the case of potentially dangerous animals or vicious animals. So we conduct, we uh, put on a hearing, do all the administrative work, uh, appoint administrative hearing officers to have to have those hearings and we do those hearings uh, in our office uh, We typically do not do business to business complaints uh, We don't have any income disqualifications. So if you are a citizen of Marin No matter how wealthy you are how poor you are you're all entitled to these uh, no-cost services um, Generally our services are involuntary our voluntary mediations uh, We don't do involuntary mediations. I understand in a in a mandatory mediation process, that would be uh, an exception. Uh, if Because in that case, both parties are agreeing, essentially, even though mandated to, uh, to mediation. So that would be something that we would actually be able to do. Um, as far as our resources go, we have two full-time attorneys uh, that act as advisors. We have two full-time mediators. One is who is a licensed attorney. The other is a bilingual uh, mediator. We have a legal secretary. We have a staff of approximately a dozen volunteer mediators uh, in a dedicated conference room wherein we hold mediations and hold hearings. Uh, all of our mediators are trained in landlord-tenant issues. Um, as far as uh, intake goes, we, we take uh, issues, uh, complaints via telephone. We take them via walk-ins. We also have uh, a new e-filing system, whereas people can uh, send in their complaints uh, via uh, electronically, rather. Um, so we're trying to uh, re uh, move over to that. Uh, as far as uh, you know, statistics that may be relevant to this board uh, regarding uh, our experience in this regard, uh, last year we opened approximately 486 uh, mediation cases. 18% uh, of those cases were landlord-tenant related. Uh, another 2% were HOA uh, related. Uh, in that same year, 2016, we took a total of about 3,800 calls uh, we, we don't have that break, broken down to how many of those were landlord-tenant related, uh, but I will say I just did review our calls from this past month ending July 2017. Uh, out of the 323 calls that we uh, took in, 25% of those were landlord-tenant related and another 5% were HOA related. Um, I, I bring up uh, HOA uh, calls uh, only because they, I think they're similar to the program that, you're, uh, that you may be considering in that uh, in order to bring a civil action in an HOA uh, dispute, you must uh, submit to or you must agree to a mediation. 
or at least that the, the steps must be taken for the mediation. Uh, and HOA is a homeowners association. So it, it's a sort of similar dynamic. The HOA would be akin to the landlord and the uh, homeowner would be akin to the, uh, to the renter. I know it's not quite the same, but it's, it's, it's similar. Uh, but they, but that, uh, the mechanism to bring a lawsuit requires that the parties endeavor to uh, mediate their disputes first. Um, before, or otherwise, you cannot bring a civil action. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do uh, animal hearings um, and parking appeal hearings. Uh, in, those, in those cases, the uh, parties have the right to have a live hearing, which we, which we do conduct. Um, we, we, we could probably uh, arrange a similar system uh, were the county to want us to uh, take a role in the mandated mediation program. Um, so that's sort of a background to what, what our uh, program provides. Uh, specifically, though, I, I did mention that we do, some of the issues we do are, uh, we do deal with some evictions um, issues. Uh, we do, we have uh, mediated cases involving rent increases. Uh, landlord wants to increase a rent uh, to a rate, you know, that's very high, 15%, say for example. Uh, we have done cases where we have gotten the parties in the room and mediated it and gotten the landlord to forego the rent increase for a year. Uh, and then at the end of the year, as part of the uh, tenants uh, agreement, they agree that if they still can't afford it after then, they would find new housing. So uh, that's what mediation is about, is getting the parties in the room and seeing if they can come to a compromise. Uh, and we also deal with, with some lease issues, uh, a lot of issues that uh, we find, uh, maybe with the code violations, we, we have dealt with uh, tenants who have brought code violations to us. Uh, we have contacted landlords and tried to work those issues out. So we, we have a broad-based program in relation to uh, landlord-tenant issues. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. Thank you, Andy. Any questions of Andy? Very, very good. Okay. Thank you so Great. much Thank you. for the information. Yes. All right, if there's no more uh, comments or questions, I, well, let's go to the public. How many people would like to speak? Okay, then it would be good if you tried to keep it down to two minutes and line up here so we don't have to wait. I mean, if you have to sit down, that's fine, but if you can stand up, that's better. Okay. Sure. Yes, welcome. Hello, um, I'm Julia Kylie Reich. I'm with Congregation Kol Shafar, a founding member of the Marin Organizing Committee. MOC includes religious and nonprofit organizations throughout Marin County representing thousands of families. We have a history of working with county officials and staff to research and craft viable solutions for the common good of all Marin citizens. It's no surprise that the most pressing issues rising up from hundreds of conversations with our members are related to housing. Skyrocket skyrocketing rent increases, arbitrary evictions, retaliation for complaints of substandard living conditions, and the lack of adequate affordable housing development are destabilizing our families and communities. We feel that though the progress made so far with the housing policy options being discussed this evening has been important, it has fallen far behind the pace of evictions and untenable rent increases. Some things our people are experiencing, rent increases of 40 to 50%, Eviction because children make noise. People living in substandard conditions because complaints result in retaliatory increases or evictions. And seniors living on fixed incomes who have no housing options allowing them to stay in their communities. Once families are evicted and are seeking new housing, they then face Marin's historically low rental vacancy rate and extremely high market rents. Do they move far enough away to find affordable housing and face long commutes to work and school? Or do they start over completely, changing jobs, schools, homes, and communities? State law protects renters from, state laws protecting renters from tooth, is, excuse me. <laughs> state laws protecting renters become toothless in jurisdictions like Marin where no reason is required to evict a tenant or rent can be raised so high that working class renters are forced to leave. We can't wait for the state legislator to sort this out when our community is being hit so hard. There are local solutions available. 
MOC recognizes the influence that the Marin County Board of Supervisors has on the decisions and policies being considered by the cities of Marin, which also need to address these issues. MOC specifically urges the Board of Supervisors to direct county staff to pursue drafting a just cause ordinance and to consider including relocation costs and fines for retaliation actions. In addition, MOC requests that the Board of Supervisors direct county staff to reconsider other renter protections, including rent stabilization and increased noticing. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Margaret Kettman Zegard, and I live in an unincorporated community of quite age. The roads were originally trails or lanes belonging to farmers. They're very narrow, and parking already without an increase of the uh, ADUs or the JADUs uh, makes a considerable hazard. Unfortunately, I'm using whistle stop. And on occasion, the, bill, the vans cannot get through, especially when a property is being upgraded, which is happening very frequently. Small homes are being torn down, so there is less uh, opportunity for a small family to get, have an affordable unit purchase or affordable property. So I believe that one of the things that might be done is for you to make a maximum size of building possible and when you have the large lots then if the, the great profit could that can be made for a very expensive home will be re reduced and there may not there may be more opportunities to have large lots and have a community of small homes built in a s nice planning uh, c c neighborhood uh, on the um, contract amendment, uh, I think that there should be funds for the building code enforcement, but the building code uh, leeway now for the JUDs, JADUs, which we used to call second units, does not, uh, as an incentive, you do not have on-site parking space. Instead, the uh, community is hazard and because of locations along the bay the frequently there is flooding and the entire egress and, f and exiting uh, and, and access to communities like Mill Valley go up through these neighborhood streets and narrow lines because they're so narrow the county does not accept uh, them as legal streets Thank and so the community, the members that live on the residences have to pay for these. So Can I you think wrap that, it that up, should please? be an important thing to consider. Also, I think you're doing a great job and I do wish that the uh, just cause will take into effect, and I didn't see it listed, the fact that aging people suddenly may have to leave their homes and make sudden purchases and so when you do your community outreach, I hope you focus on the aging community as well and give some kind of accommodation to us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you all watch the lights while you're talking, it will t give you a clue. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. My name is Esmeralda Leva. I am from JPC San Rafael Church. Eight years ago, my family and I moved into a townhouse in Nevada and signed a one-year lease. We were excited to move in with our son and welcome our daughter a few years later. We had some typical problems with the apartment. The heat stopped working once and we also had ants. But the landlords were pretty, pretty responsive and always fixed things. When our lease was expired, we were given the choice of signing a renewal lease or simply paying month to month and our rent was raised by $50. My husband and I decided to get on a month to month because we didn't feel like it was necessary to do the year commitment since everything was going well. After three years of being excellent tenants, out of the blue came the 60 day notice 
to evacuate the apartment without giving any notice as to why. We were shocked as to why this was happening to us. We couldn't understand why the landlord was acting that way when we had been very good tenants. We always paid our rent on time since it was direct deposit and we also had an end unit and we always followed rules. Not once did we receive any paper expressing their dissatisfaction with our tenancy. But out of the blue came the no cost eviction letter. As a family, we felt betrayed. It was an extremely stressful time. We tried looking for apartment for the first 30 days with no luck. We were starting to get desperate since we had the responsibility. to put a roof over our children. But how do you do that when you're being thrown out of your so-called stable home just because the landlord felt like doing it? Luckily, one week before we ran out of time, we found a two-bedroom apartment. After we moved out, we did an intense deep cleaning but they, skip, they still kept our moving deposit and even decided to charge us extra because they decided to change the carpet at our expense. Mm. It is unfair to get evicted for no cause. But unfortunately, we are defenseless against our landlord. I even sought a help at legal aids, but since we had already moved out, they said they couldn't, there wasn't much they could do. Even if we had filed a claim in small courts, our chances of winning were 50-50. And it could be a long process, and they could always retaliate. We need some sort of rent protection in Marine, so that like people like me who follow all the rules don't have to suddenly scramble to find a home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Yes. Hi, my name hi. is <coughs> Hi. My name is Meg Brizolera. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been a tenant in Marin County for 42 out of the 44 years that I've lived here, and I've always felt vulnerable. Always felt very vulnerable. I've had um, landlords drive up to my apartment and threaten to put my son in a foster home if they saw him playing outside without me being in attendance. Um, I've been evicted, and I suspect that it was for complaining about conditions. They remodeled my apartment uh, with me in it. Um, seven in the morning, there'd be workers tearing my bedroom wall apart, um, and I complained about that, and they said, oh, we're so sorry, uh, and within a week, I got an order to vacate. Now, I will never know what the real reason is because they don't have to tell me. Landlords in Marin County can evict you for any reason. I know people that have gotten evicted because their grandson came to visit and he happened to have dreadlocks. There are no tenant protections other than the ones provided by the state. And those are protections that are very difficult to enforce. I went to two different lawyers after that happened to me, both of whom were uh, slanted toward the landlords. I couldn't find one that was uh, in favor of tenants, one that worked exclusively with tenants, because there aren't any here in Marin, at least not at that time. There was legal aid, but they don't take a lot of ca new cases. They're overwhelmed and they're short-staffed. So I basically had to find another place to live, which was extremely difficult, being a single parent at the time, and having the amount of time to find another place to live is not that helpful because it's just more time where it's hanging over your head. Where am I going to find another place to live in this expensive, expensive county? Um, I got a CAT scan this morning, and the tech that did the CAT scan lives out in Hercules. She does the exams, the CAT scan exams here in Marin. She drives an hour and a half here and an hour and a half home. She has three children. That's three hours every day. She's part of the traffic that we all complain about. 
This is why there's traffic that we all complain about, because people can't afford to live here. And the least we can do is get just cause eviction, like a lot of the, the counties around us have. It's the least we can do, and I, I defy any landlord to come up with a reason why they would oppose this. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Board of Supes. My name is Joe Walsh. I've lived in Marin since 1966. I'm here tonight as my hat is I'm a member of the board of the San Geronimo Valley Affordable Housing Association. So I'd like to take first a minute to thank you for your uh, not only support but your initiative in helping us twice. Uh, the first acquisition in Forest Knowles was six units uh, for senior housing and more recently <laughs> a year and a half ago uh, the Forest Knowles trailer court. Uh, both have been very successful, full since day one. Uh, Lily Thomas has been an amazing resource uh, and, and helpful to us and, and you and the Community Foundation and uh, have and Bach grants have given us uh, great support and we appreciate that. Um, my first hope is that we will put a big emphasis on preservation. Uh, Lily can tell you how many affordable units have been uh, created here in Marin in the last 40 years. She can probably do it on her hands and her toes. Um, in a previous life, uh, 25 years ago, I was on the board of the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce. We had the first affordable housing uh, committee in the United States, and we created a list of sites to be preserved. We came up with 27 sites to be preserved. Uh, 25 of those are gone. None of them were ever used for affordable housing. Um, I'm, I'm sure hoping, you know, I, I know you're trying. You, you, you've been much better than other jurisdictions in the state and in, in the United States. Um, I, the last thing I want to say is uh, we, we definitely support the just cause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gustavo Gonsalves. I'm 26, a uh, Marin County resident and a Marin County employee. Uh, as a 26-year-old and a member of uh, Marin County local government, I want to talk about uh, my demographic a little bit. So with census from 2010 showed that the over 18 and under 65 population was roughly 57 percent. Uh, persons 65 years and older were 42, almost 43 percent. The 2016 census showed the over 18 and under 65 population at 54, with persons 65 and older at 45. The reason I bring this up is that along with Prop 13 and 55 year and older communities within Marin County that offer some safeguards, it's trying as a youth to find affordable housing, uh, let alone thinking about ownership, just rent alone. So with that, excuse me. So there's also been discussion of a silver tsunami and emerging uh, population of retirees. I would like to see a consideration of youth and the prospective labor for within Marin County uh, so that we can continue to contribute and live where we provide services so that we can be representatives and stakeholders of our community. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much. Hello. First, before I start, if I could pass this, please, to the board and ask all of you who are here for rental protection to raise your hand, please. Thank you. So, as often is the case, I will start out with a rhetorical question, this time to President Arnold. President Arnold, do you know who Edward J. Smith was? We don't have questions and answer periods. For I knew that, so I'm going to answer it so for go you. Ahead. Thank you. As you have, he had a Title II. He was captain of the Titanic. 
Who do you serve? Who gets to find a place in the lifeboats? Those landlords who earn an increasingly comfortable living from their land in Marin, I'm a landlord, I know what, what it's like, which has rents like San Francisco, not Sonoma or Napa or Solano. We are not suburban, we border San Francisco. Or the workers, who finds a place in the lifeboats? The workers, who you just heard from, the low-income elderly, the homeless and precariously homeless, and other people who are underserved. We're going through yet another assessment of fair housing. That's been going on for a year and a half. This process has been going on for a year and a half. We're sinking. People are in pain. The past decisions of this board, not you five, but the supervisors that precede you, have resulted in a dire and painful situation for many. You'll hear a lot of about those tonight. It's time to make better decisions. Pass a fair, just, a fair just cause eviction ordinance tonight. You don't have to wait. Staff has it ready. Establish fair, a fair rent stabilization. The largest single expense I have as a landlord is a property tax, which is capped at 2%. What justifies significantly greater than that? Establish mediation to settle disputes, collect data for the demographics of JDUs and ADUs, repair and expand the HOD so many parcels provide opportunities for affordable housing. We need incentives, not flexibility. Where is the balance if over 84% of Marin remains off the table for affordable housing? Where is the justice? Where is the fairness? Where is the mercy? Where is the equity? Where are the lifeboats? Buenas noches, mi nombre es Cecilia. Yo he vivido en mi apartamento más de 20 años. Es tan difícil tener que quedarte callado cuando se descompone algo en mi perdón. Cuando se descompone algo, ya que muchas veces cuando me quejé de que mi apartamento necesitaba alguna cosa que arreglar, ellos me aumentaban la renta y me mandaban el bill de la reparación. En los últimos cinco años, dos de los cuartos donde mis hijas duermen han estado goteando. Los dueños no han sabido por qué gotea. Yo tengo temporalmente un pedazo de chirroc donde el techo se cayó en la, de, de la gotera. Esto hace cinco años y continúa igual. La defensa, defensa que que me divide entre mi vecino y yo, casi se cae. Hoy, hace dos meses, los apartamentos fueron vendidos. En menos de un mes, el nuevo dueño me envió un primer aumento de renta de 700 dólares para pagar septiembre primero, primera, primero nueva renta será de 2,500. Yo trabajo siete días de la semana. Tengo tres trabajos. Ya no tengo más tiempo para poder encontrar otro part-time. Yo estoy enferma y mi enfermedad es de diabetes. Tampoco me lo permite. Ni siquiera me imagino qué es lo que, ten, perdón, qué es lo que voy a tener que hacer para poder pagar este aumento de renta. Se necesita que haya un cambio. Yo no soy la única en estas condiciones. Habemos muchos. Gracias. Hi, my name is Christina I'm going to trash lay well, she said. I have been living in my apartment for more than 20 years. It's so hard to stay silent when something need to fix. When I call them to come and fix something, we'll send somebody. After we'll, we'll fix it, I get the bill sent to me, plus my red increase. I have a leaky I have it, two bedrooms leaking for five years. The owners don't have a clue what is the situation. I have a piece of tree rock for the last past five years. The owner don't have a clue what is the problem. Temporarily, they put a tree rock. With, until right now, continue to be the same. The fence 
the buy me to my neighbor is fall, almost falling apart. Two months ago, the apartments were sold. The new owner, in menu, at least a month, they sent me my first rent increase, $700, to pay September 1st. My new rent going to be 2500 I work seven days a week. I have three different jobs. I don't have any more time to find another part-time. I'm sick. I have diabetes, and that no help. I cannot imagine what I need to do to continue to pay the rent. I know the only one in this situation. Something needs to change. Thank you. Thank you. When you get up, I think it causes static if you hold the microphone, so don't, don't hold it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Deborah Taub. I'm a resident of San Rafael, and I'm speaking on behalf of United Marin Rising, a grassroots organization here in the, in the county that focuses on social justice issues, which includes housing justice. United Marin Rising urges the Marin County Board of Supervisors to immediately adopt a just cause eviction ordinance following the lead of Bay Area jurisdictions, including San Jose, Oakland, East Palo Alto, Berkeley, Mountain View, Richmond, and the city of Alameda that have adopted new or updated rental housing protections in the past year. It is shameful for one of the wealthiest counties in the United States to subject thousands of residents to the unnecessary risk of homelessness posed by permissible no-cause evictions. Marin's own countywide plan prioritizes balanced communities that house and employ persons from all income, income groups, a goal rendered impossible when landlords may evict lower income tenants for the sole purpose of raising rental rates. Just cause eviction policies promote cohesive, self-sufficient, and safe communities without the constant threat of destabilization caused by frequent residential turnover in a county whose predominantly low-wage workforce must largely commute in from other areas with greater housing availability, we cannot risk further housing vulnerability and displacement. Additionally, United Marin Rising strongly urges the Board of Supervisors to consider and adopt further rental housing protections such as rent stabilization and relocation cost provisions. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Bob Pandoli. I'm speaking tonight for the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative. And we strongly urge that your board uh, pursue a just cause eviction ordinance. It's badly needed to provide um, a measure of fairness and stability to residential tenants in the county. Today, landlords have the right to evict their tenants who have fallen behind in rent or breach material clauses in their rental lease agreements. We don't question that. Or we recognize that right. However, tenants have absolutely no protection from arbitrary evictions if, the, um, if they rent from month to month or at the expiration of a longer term lease. So we think there are three important reasons why you should um, adopt a just cause eviction ordinance. First and most important is equity. Lacking a just cause eviction ordinance, the property owner holds all of the high cards. A local property management firm seeking invest investors advertises on its site I quote, investors consistently profit year after year from robust property appreciation in Marin with average per year gain of 10%, end of quote. So in economic terms, landlords have no financial incentive to be fair to their tenants because there are no vacancies and tenants have nowhere in the county, in many cases, where they can afford to go. We think that basic fairness depends, demands that the tenants should have a, low, a, level, a level playing field. A second consideration is displacement. Uh, so when tenants are forced out of their homes, the unmet need, unmet demand gets one household higher and the market gets tighter. A third consideration is just basic habitability. Often, as you've heard tonight, um, renters are afraid to, to seek even simple repairs to their home out of fear of facing eviction. Instead, they tolerate substandard and sometimes unsafe conditions. We think that the majority of landlords play fair, treat their tenants with respect, and evict only when absolutely necessary. We think that a carefully drafted just cause eviction ordinance, one that sets clear standards for eviction and, if, and protects property owners from unfair claims by tenants, um, will not adversely ad impact the majority of landlords who are in fact fair. 
Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Carmen Ruen. Vivo en <coughs> Vista del Mar, San Rafael. Vivo en un apartamento, en, en un tanjao de tres, de tres cuartos. Viven, vivimos cinco personas allí. Tengo diez años de vivir allí, desde el 2007. Y trabajo en Terra Linda en una casa de ancianos. Tengo 13 años de trabajar allí. La señora que es mi arrendataria, el, el año pasado, por el mes de noviembre, me le aumentó 436 al, a la renta. Y después de eso empezó con un hostigamiento. Empezó a, a llamar y llamar por teléfono y llamar que donde quiera que yo estaba, ya tenía grabado el, que ella era la que, la que me estaba llamando. Y después de eso, mi hijo la sentó y le dijo, ¿sabes qué? Vamos a hablar, ¿por qué el hostigamiento? Y le dijo a ella, le dijo mi hijo, le hizo una pregunta, te voy a hacer dos preguntas. ¿Te, te tiene deteriorada el, 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 la casa de mi madre? No. ¿Te ha fallado en la renta? No. Y entonces, ¿cuál es el problema? Porque yo necesito aumentarle a 3,020. Y me es más... Y me es más fácil sacar tu madre. <ríe> me es más fácil sacarla de allí que aumentarle otra vez, porque es contra de la ley, le dijo ella. Porque en un año no me podían aumentar dos veces. Y me querían aumentar más de 600 dólares. My name, is, Rogel. My name is Carmen Rogel. I live in Vista del Mar, San Rafael. I have a um, duplex with uh, three bedrooms with five people living in it. I've been living in there since 2007. I, in November, the owner of the uh, duplex sent me a letter said that I will, that I will raise my rent $400 more. After that, he was calling and calling, constantly calling. And we asked her, Where, why are you calling him? My son and I sat down with her, and we asked her what was the reason for her constantly calling. She said that she needed to raise the rent to 3200 And she felt bad to raise the rent $700 more within the second time within a year. But she needed to come up with the money, and it was easy and better for her for us to move for, than for her to uh, expect for us to come out with seven hundred dollars more. Okay, great. Thank you. Ahora, a mí me parece una casa injusta eso. Que cómo es posible que un arrendatario pueda pueda apoyarlo la ley porque a, a donde quiera que yo he preguntado me dicen lamentablemente la señora tiene la razón. Y entonces cuál ley apoya al, al que renta. I feel really bad because I have asked people around where you see these owners coming with. How can I, the justice be just here and have the back and the lender and not on the person that is in need of the justice? Where I have asked, they told me that he has the rights to charge me that. A mí el, el sueldo que gano no me alcanza para pagar más. My no income does not afford for me to pay the more that what she's asking for. Y me parece tan injusto eso. Me gustaría que hubiera una ley que que apoyara al al que renta, al que alquila. That makes me feel that there is no justice, and I wish there was a law to protect us, the ones who rent. 
Gracias. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing. I'm Arianne Dar from the Bolinas Community Land Trust, and um, we also support just cause evictions and rate rent stabilization. But I think I'll um, comment on two other things. I'm strongly in favor of Lily's request for staff to help with looking for, I don't know how she phrased it, but alternative forms and working with things. I in, in one week, I had six possible things that we might have been able to save in Bolinas, and it takes a lot of creative thinking to figure out how that might happen. And I know Lily gets really tired of hearing from me every time I have one. Um, and as I said, six in one week. In, in the course of 10 days, there were eight of them. So it's, it's constant, and um, sometimes we can come up with a creative solution, but it would help Lily a lot to not have to deal with me all the time. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is um, the, I would like you to keep the second unit amnesty on, if not for any other reason but for Bolinas. A lot of our residents live in illegal second units, and with new NIMBY people coming into town, they're very fond of turning in um, landlords who have those second units, which means those people are losing their housing. I believe that there are ways to get to, I'm, I'm working with environmental health currently on a septic program that would reduce the cost of upgrading a septic by roughly, um, roughly 40%, so it would be 60% of the cost to upgrade your septic. If all of those second people who had illegal second units could upgrade their systems, they would be able to legalize those second units and they wouldn't be terminated. So I would like to work with the county more around septic upgrades and figuring out how to do that rather than eliminating amnesty for second units. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, David Levin, uh, Managing Attorney at Legal Aid of Marin. Would like to thank you and your staff for your attention to this important issue on behalf of our clients, too, in Marin, who represent the elderly, the disabled, low paid workers, and immigrants, many others. But we regularly hear from our immigrant clients in Marin, they are more worried about eviction than deportation. And we regularly see the need for a just cause ordinance. We also recognize the utility it will be limited without corresponding attention to the, the rent problems that you've heard about, but it would still be a great help to our clients who are suffering from the housing crisis in Marin. Last night at this time, this exact time last night, we were meeting with a group of Latino renters who just got a 30% rent increase in their complex from the new corporate owner. And, and this crisis, it's exacerbating the imbalance between renters and owners uh, the, to understand the unlawful detainer uh, procedures in court, it's important to recognize the system is set up for rent cases, you know, non-payment of rent, which are the majority of cases, but those are cases where the landlord wins 90% of the time, and it's practically impossible, and I'm speaking as a legal aid attorney with over 10 years experience in, in housing, uh, to prevail on a retaliation or discrimination claim with the risks to the renters and, and this imbalance and the time is, scope is so constrained, uh, most people will just settle or, or find some other way to resolve the case. The cases where we're successful now is when we go into court before the eviction starts, and I just want to mention two recent cases. One, our client organized a protest letter to the landlord about a lease violation, and the only response from the owner was a 60-day no-cause eviction notice. Another case we recently saw where a renter called the police for help because he felt one of his children was threatened, next day got a 60-day no-cause eviction notice. So uh, there, there was really no significant burden on, on the owners from requiring a statement of cause where they feel it's appropriate, and we appreciate the attention to this issue. We would be glad to help if there's any questions or any other, uh, anything else we could do. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Wendy Callens. I'm with Coalition for a Livable Marin. Uh, Marin made the headlines, national headlines recently, um, where we were accused of being a elitist hypocritical community because of our unwillingness to provide affordable housing. 
You have an opportunity tonight to dispel that perception. Your staff has told you that the most effective way you can preserve housing in Marin County is through tenant protections, both just cause and rent stabilization. It's not only the most effective, but it's the most cost effective way we can preserve affordable housing. It will not provide new housing, but it will certainly help the people you have heard tonight. And for many of the people you have heard tonight, there's no way they could have proved retaliation, that this was retaliation. And I think that's what you're finding out and why we need stronger regulations here in Marin County. Um, a lot of also people say, well, rent control doesn't work. And I, and I want to say it doesn't work for who? Um, it, it, works, it would work for the people you have heard tonight, for the stories you have heard tonight. So a lot of landlords, you know, with these rent increases, even at 10%, which is, I think, what the, what the recommendation for mediation is, I want you to think about what it would be like if your employees union asked for a 10% raise, if you could afford that, and then think about what it would be like to get a 10% increase in your housing year after year, sometimes two or three times a year. We have to level the playing fields. These landlords raise the rents because they can. As you've seen in today's headlines, and I see it sitting over there on the table, we are now on par with San Francisco as far as our rents are concerned. We are on a sinking ship, and I beg you to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kim Thompson, and I serve as the director of CLAM, which is a community land trust. And as a community land trust, our goal is to create stability within our communities. And we serve the communities surrounding Tomales Bay. Because our primary mission is to create stability across communities, I'm here to strongly recommend and back your staff's recommendation for a just cause ordinance. There is simply too much ambiguity right now that people who rent are facing. And we see that all the time in the CLAM office. Um, a, just cause, uh, a just cause ordinance is a critical measure, just one in a, a very important suite of measures that could help bring some level of stability for people who rent. And also to say that, yes, we absolutely do need rent stabilization to be on the table across Marin County and certainly in the unincorporated areas of West Marin. This is the kind of stability that our communities need. To speak to a couple of other items briefly in the staff report, um, we, we support, we, we have really enjoyed being in a partnership with the county and with <coughs> Marin Community Foundation in acquisition of the Ocean Terrace Apartments. We find that our challenges are such that the more we work together and strategize together, we can make things happen. And we support every effort um, of the staff to have more expertise or more technical assistance there that they need. And also, um, we, we just want to say that wherever the second unit amnesty, amnesty program ends up, first of all, we really appreciate Supervisor Radoni's work on that with environmental health. And um, second units in West Marin and in the coastal zone are really uh, sticky wicket for a, a number of reasons. And thank goodness for the new state laws that um, kind of level the playing field for JDU and ADU creation, but there's still big issues in West Marin regarding septic and regarding building permits. So wherever the county feels is appropriate for that to land, those are big pieces we still need to work out, and there's um, local leadership that we would love to put forward to work in partnership with county staff to address environmental health and building permit issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mark Swyskin. I'm uh, here on behalf of Marin Organizing Committee, simply to say that uh, we're looking forward to uh, meeting with Supervisors Connolly and Rice next Wednesday, the 9th, for more in-depth discussions about with renters about some of the challenges that we're hearing about now. And we'll be reaching out to other supervisors as well and look forward to opportunities for conversations with you as well. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, supervisors um, and fellow Marine community members. My name is Erica Erickson, and I have been a resident of Marine for over 16 years, and many of them as a tenant. I also had the honor to serve on the Planning Commission for two years, um, some years ago. 
and that's when we were able to respond to community needs to include the tenant protection program in the housing element. That was a need then and it's a greater need now. And it will be much worse if you, because it's in your hands, or we as a community, don't take action now. I want to thank you for advancing, you and the staff for advancing some of the aspects of the housing element related to tennis protection, but I was extremely disappointed by the lack of political will to advance any form of rent stabilization proposing the housing element some months ago. Now you have the opportunity to advance the work or to establish a just cause ordinance. We should follow the lead of other counties in the just cause movement. It's a wise decision for kids, families, and business that employ parents. <laughs> it will diminish the suffering you heard about today from tenants. My experience as a tenant is similar to others here. We stay quiet to not disturb the landlords. We play dead to keep our, our roof above our heads. Today, I serve, uh, I serve uh, you as your Marine County Child Care Commission Coordinator, and I have a, a great honor with that. And using that hat, I also want to remind you that our early educa education professionals and teachers are the tenants that we are talking about here today, including family child care providers that are business owners that depend on their housing and the many of them are tenants. And as you heard someone saying today, sometimes they're evicted because the kids make too much noise. Your decision affects directly kids and families in our county and your inaction we exacerbate the inequalities and the suffering we are facing, Marine. For these reasons, I respectfully ask your vote to advance the work of, on a just cause ordinance for Marine. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Supervisors. My name is Linda Jackson. I am Program Director for the Aging Action Initiative. The other day we had a meeting and we had staff people from the health sector and the caregiver sector and then the mental health sector. And to a person they said they are not getting responses to their <laughs> want ads. People are not even replying to work here in Marin. And these are critical jobs for the caregiving of older residents in, San, in, in Marin County. Um, I, we know you're leaders of all of the elected bodies in Marin County. You're the one who's been having these meetings every few months to look at what you're doing and what more you can do. So there's two things I'd like to ask. And one, the first one is related to number six. I'd say please keep that on and please see what else can happen. That's the second unit. So you've heard about amnesty, but there are more things we can do to let seniors know what their options are with their house. And just to throw out some wild ideas, full page ad in the IJ, a supplemental in the IJ a couple of years, a couple of times a year. How do you do it? Because it's difficult for a homeowner, but the answer, these, these A dues and J dues are good for the older and younger homeowners and the older and younger renters. So it's really a four for one with that particular one. The second item is to measure. So I read the report. I did read it in Spanish. My neighbor had a copy in Spanish. So I didn't see data. Now, you've been talking about this since 2015. So you should be able to see how many units have been added in 2014, 15, 16, and the first six months of 2017. The number of units added uh, is kind of a supplemental metric for preservation and, um, you know, of your two actions. So I encourage you to have an action and maybe your next staff report will show you how you're doing and how critical the housing crisis is in Marin. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Carolyn Peaty. I am the Executive Director of Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California. Um, and I want to thank you all for considering taking this next step to furthering fair housing in the county um, in adopting the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance. And rather than um, repeating things that other people have said, I want to just emphasize a couple of points. One is uh, the first speaker who, um, representing MOC, gave a number of different reasons as to why um, people receive move-out notices. 
not that they're stated because the housing provider doesn't have to stay, say anything. And we have seen at um, our agency pretty much all of those examples, like the you know children having noise and so on. Um, I also want to say something about retaliatory eviction. Uh, retaliatory eviction, there, the presumption of retaliatory, uh, uh, there's a presumption of retaliation if um, the negative action is taken within six months. But after that six months, it's, you know, tenants are fair game and they can receive eviction notices like that and do. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that even when you can prove that it's retaliatory, um, after that six months is over, uh, that's, um, it, it can often be mean the sort of the, the death knell for tenants, um, for landlords who want to move tenants out. Uh, we really need to protect the most vulnerable populations in Marin. You've been hearing some of the some stories. Um, and, you know, we, we're an aging county. You already know this. Um, we have a population with a lot of disability-related needs. We have um, immigrants who are fearful often of expressing um, what's going on in their homes. Um, and, and it's in a county where there's um, very little affordable housing. I will tell you from a personal perspective, as a low-income um, uh, single parent, within the first eight years of, of my son's life, I had to move four times. And the only reason I stopped having to move is that my parents died and left me some money so that I could actually scrape together a down payment. But most people are um, not in that position who are um, renters here. And so I wanted to just say that it's, um, and, and of course, on the, on the flip side of it, my son is going to, uh, who's now an adult, is going to have a very, very difficult time ever living in this county as you heard from, from one of the speakers earlier. So I thank you for considering the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance, um, and I urge you to waste no time in adopting it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Raleigh Katz, Marine Association of Public Employees. Uh, to our good friend Wendy Callens, I find 10% to hardly be unreasonable, but I digress. Uh, as you know, we, have, we represent more than half of the county employees. Um, last time I looked, about half of them live in the county, about half of them don't, but those numbers change for people hired more recently where it's about two-thirds who don't live in the county because they cannot afford to live here. That's typical of many working people regardless by whom they are employed. Uh, the steps you have outlined here and have taken, like acquisition, preservation, landlord partnership, have certainly had positive results, but I would note that in terms of purchasing existing properties so they remain affordable, that preserves affordable housing, but it doesn't expand the amount of affordable housing. Getting more landlords to take Section 8 certainly makes more property available to those folks, but again, doesn't expand the overall pool and doesn't expand the pool for people who make just too much to get Section 8, but not enough to be able to afford this kind of housing. So in this current market, which is so skewed to the owner of property, uh, I think that you've got to consider seriously steps that have been suggested, like the just cause <coughs> eviction, Retali there are lots of evictions that are not for just cause, that are not, for, that are not retaliatory, that would never rise to the standard of proving retaliation. I'm going to raise the rent because I can get more money or because I want to have my brother-in-law move in or because I want to turn it into an Airbnb and sorry that you're out of a place to live. That's not retaliation. And so just cause and some kind of rent stabilization seem to be reasonable things to do in this environment. And then lastly, we've got to build more housing. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that in this county, but we have to build more housing, and I think some of the suggestions addressed some ways you might be able to do that, and, and, and you need to not just think about that, but implement that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Ron Usak, and I'm speaking on behalf of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank the board for the outstanding, outstanding work that you do. And our office or just the Board of Supervisors to please always keep in mind the needs of the developmentally disabled population. Affordable housing is very important for our population. We are, we are always looking for affordable, integrated, inclusive, permanent housing for our population. And we just want to say that we support the Just Cause Eviction Ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm David Schoenbrunn. I'm an aging tenant. <laughs> and I want to speak about what didn't get said about just cause eviction. And that is that most landlords are not implicated and won't be affected by an action that you hopefully will take. 
The, the aim of a just cause eviction is to constrain the predators. This is all about windfall profits, literally unjustified profits that are being taken at the expense of defenseless tenants. And so this is something that is very much needed in this county. Uh, when I lived in San Francisco, there was already a long history of owner move-in eviction violations. These were um, phony uh, propositions. Um, and so it's important that you look to language adopted by San Francisco that give the tenant the right to go after a landlord that evicted them for false reasons. Um, finally, I want to comment on the need for rent control. Um, the, the point of a just cause eviction is to establish community values in terms of what is to be expected of landlords and to say that certain behavior is outside the limits. That's what rent control does. It's another step in the same process. Having rent control would affect cap rates and as such would prevent the uh, outrageous escalation of property values that are in some ways driving these rent increases. And so again, cap rates is what this is all about. And if you influence the expectations of potential property investors who otherwise would come in, displace tenants, and um, seek to change out the tenancies. That's actually in the public interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is the lady in the yellow sweater our last speaker? We still have one more. One more. Okay, great. Thank you. You'll be the last. Thank you for your patience through this process. <clears throat> My name is Scott Gerber. I'm a resident of San Rafael homeowner. I'm an apartment owner and um, a multifamily specialist since 1989. <clears throat> I felt it important to speak up as a minority tonight. Um, we're all here for the same reason. We all want a healthy county. We want a healthy job market and we want a healthy housing market. That's the goal. But we've got a problem, and nobody's talking about it. I don't think, I've heard a couple people allude to it. We've got a supply problem. Property owners, landlords, people that rent their homes aren't, didn't create the situation, but it is a situation and it's a problem. We need affordable housing for our lower income residents of the county. The market has responded, rents are up, but what some people don't know or maybe haven't mentioned is that rents went down three times in the last, since I've been tracking this market, which is since 19, uh, I'm sorry, since 2000, no, since 1997. They went down 94 to 96, they went down 2000 to 2002, and they went down again 2008 to 2011. The market works. It's working now, but the problem is we need supply. We need to add supply, we need to earmark funds for new affordable housing. Take a look at the transfer tax. This real estate market has produced windfall um, property assessment income and also uh, transfer tax income. Take a look at that, maybe earmark some money for affordable housing. We need it. Um, making it harder for property owners to operate this very limited supply of housing isn't the answer. We need a healthy housing stock, and the result is a greater supply. Um, programs like the Landlord Partnership Section 8 program work. Rental housing community has shown cooperation, and that works. Progress has been made, but if we can increase the supply of market and affordable housing, we will move towards that solution. We all benefit when there's a healthy rental market and people of all income levels have a place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Olivia Beltran. I don't know, should I speak 
before about uh, my representation with the nonprofit. I work with Canal Welcome Center as associate director, so I get to see firsthand the difficulties that people in the, in the communities in Marin County live, the low-income people of color, underrepresented communities. So on their behalf, I ask or urge the Board of Supervisors to take action on the just cause. And um, I always got to wear my personal hat. I always tell people, you know, before being an employee of anyone or anything, we're human beings and sometimes we forget our voices. So uh, this next episode is me. I've been in Marin County for 33 years. It's amazing. There were times when my kids were little and I used to, we used to hike around Phoenix Lake and I used to tell them, let's identify where the water is and where we're gonna carve a cave so we can go live there, you know, if the, the landlord decides to kick us out. Throughout our lives, we, you know, we had a stress about being tenants and we still do because one of my daughters, uh, she's 22, well, my old, one of my daughters has a mental illness and she has dual diagnosis. And as living as tenants, it was very complicated when she was going through the psychosis episodes, you know, because then she raised the volume of the music very loud. Of course, the, um, the other tenant had the right to complain. And um, we were about to lose our housing. You know, we got some warnings from the landlord. And I think it's also because it was one time when she called me and I was deprived from sleep and I was kind of rude in my tone, you know. And I never got a chance to go back and iron things out with her. But I'm very lucky that I have a really reasonable tenant. And I got to give kudos to Garbarino, you know, because they, oh, I love the fact that they own a lot of property because up to this point they haven't gotten very greedy like many others. But it's just to consider that just cause is for people that, um, that, you know, t that really have done something wrong. So at that point in time, we did something wrong, you know. And considering the situations and circumstances, I cannot imagine what other people with mental illness go through. Uh, luckily, my daughter is stable, but it takes process for a person with mental illness to become stable. So there are a whole variety. As um, I would urge you already to go back and revisit just um, rent a stabilization because as we see, that's one that is creating a lot of crises within our communities, you know, with the people. I'm glad that there were people here from the community expressing about their stories and just know that this is a dire search situation that we tenants, we live under. Hi, um, my name is Wendy and I live in Fairfax and I um, am a renter and am way too vulnerable. Um, it's unsafe for me to say anything about my personal story here, renting. But we all know that there's been a rental crisis going on around the Bay Area and beyond for years now. And Marin's done hardly anything to to address it, I've been working with the town of Fairfax for over a year begging for something, anything. So I am really grateful that you're considering all of this tonight. It is way past due, it's way past time, and as a renter who's low income and disabled, I would take any protections. State laws don't cover us for hardly anything. Um, even the laws that we do have, like many people have said before, they may be laws and they may be there, but there's no recourse for when a landlord doesn't follow those laws at all. And it's too unsafe because of the issue of eviction and rental increases. So I am begging you to pass just cause eviction um, laws. And I would love for there to also be um, um, limits on how much a rent can be raised. Um, they go together, but I would take just cause over nothing. Um, and I also do think that the second unit amnesty program needs to continue. I don't think what's in place is necessarily enough. And I'm really heartened by all the stories and all of the people who spoke before me. Um, it's a relief to hear other people speak about these issues at all, and I really hope that you take into consideration doing something now and not later. Um, and it's not true that, I mean, even if rent, if, even if there's, 
even if there's um, proof statistically that rents have not increased, even if the numbers you said were true, 2011 was years ago. So even with what you said, rental increases are an issue and losing our homes is an issue. And this county has changed a lot since I've lived here. I used to live in Alameda County before moving here years ago. And I've just watched the entire town and county change so much and so many friends have left. It's a big deal what's going on and I really hope you do something. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming, for those who spoke and those who didn't but are here lending their support. Um, what I'd like to do is I want to give ch uh, staff a chance to respond, but also <clears throat> it would be really good if you could go through, and as I see it, there are three actions you, you want, to, want us to take tonight. The uh, mandatory mediation, just cause evictions, and, re and reevaluation of the HOD. Right, or, or do you want to? Well, those are, are three of, uh, I believe, five policy this, options yeah, or six, six that, that, yeah. um, that really are the focus of our, our discussions. Mm -hmm. um, there are two other items that we're seeking your direction on, and I want to number one and two. Correct. Something that I suggested at the beginning of my comments, which was that we were looking for direction on how to proceed and further study and refine and come back. But with respect to the voluntary rent guidelines, we're requesting you to, or suggesting or recommending that you can make a decision on discontinuing that program this evening and then approving a contract amendment with the Rent Housing Authority that would allow the reallocation of that funding towards the Landlord Incentives Program. Okay. And then with respect to the se Second Unit Amnesty Program, I want to make a comment about that. There are a few folks that um, mentioned that. And, our, our recommendation to delete is really a bit of a misnomer because what we're essentially suggesting is to not repeat uh, a second unit amnesty program based upon uh, state laws that no longer exist. As you may recall from our recent development code amendment discussions, the recent state legislation has preempted local regulations to in the areas of what are now called accessory dwelling units, no longer called second units, in some important ways particularly restricting or, or prohibiting additional parking, allowing additional size. Uh, and so what we're essentially recommending in that area is to refocus and reshift our efforts to kind of furthering the, um, the state laws by trying to ease the regulatory hurdles, the regulatory burdens in the area of septic system requirements for accessory dwelling units in particular as well as trying to retool our building permit process in a way that would also um, make the decisions on permit requests for ADUs and JDUs uh, as efficient as possible. We've been working with um, another board sub subcommittee on that, Supervisor Radoni and Supervisor Arnold are involved in that, and I know Supervisor Radoni um, has made it a priority to, to work in the area of septic systems in, in his district on ADU and JDU. Uh, and so that's essentially what we're, um, what is at the heart of that recommendation. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. That was very helpful, Brian, and just to make sure that I understand this. So what, whatever glide path there was under the amnesty program when you had a second unit that was not legally recognized, there still is a process under the new state law that you could legitimize an existing ADU, right? So yes, that's state correct. state law is very much mm -hmm. about creating new ones. That and I'm just wanting to make sure that that's, that encompasses those that exist. It does. That are outside and, the and system And thank you for formally. bringing up that distinction because our, our efforts that we're engaged in now to facilitate ADU and JDUs not only applies to new units but also the legalization of existing what were formally called second units um, and we've been um, postponing, deferring uh, enforcement actions ever since the state legislation went into effect to try to give the advantage and the benefit of property owners who are in the situation of having to legalize a former second unit so that we can take, try to take advantage as much as possible of these new state regulations as well as our own local right. efforts to try to get those units legalized. Great. Thank you. So I don't have any other comments. Um, uh, you, I don't know if 
Any, any other comments? Lady? No, I don't think okay. so. Okay, so then I'm gonna bring it back to the board. Um, and um, do you, well, first of all, do you have questions regarding the comments that you heard tonight? Okay. No questions, so let's do comments. And I'm gonna call on um, Supervisor Conley. Great, can we get the list back up? Yeah, sure. So in terms of where we go from here, it, it may be a um, good idea to walk through each of the recommendations in yeah, sequence. So it would be helpful to yeah, and we want it on our screens right. too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. okay. there, there we can. go. You can almost see it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, it, the, this is available on the, our website. So the first item, as Lily mentioned, her presentation is a is an effort that is being pursued through our uh, board housing subcommittee does not involve your board taking any action tonight other than um, if you wish to uh, endorse that publicly we'll be working with the county administrator's office uh, and the possibly the Marin Community Foundation to expand our efforts to bring in professional assistance to facilitate acquisitions um, in the area of developing pro formas and uh, feasibility studies and along with that um, identifying potential owners of um, properties that are acquired. So we'll report back to you um, when we uh, have the, the time in the future on that. The Landlord Partnership Program uh, is linked to the, um, the number three, two and three are kind of inextricably linked in the sense that um, we want to enhance the uh, the program by um, deleting the voluntary rent guidelines and then shifting the funding that had previously been allocated for voluntary rent guideline developments into the landlord incentive program. Do you want to do this one at a time? No, I, well, it's it's up to your pleasure, Madam President. I can kind of whip through okay. all of them and then Great. if others want to pick and choose. And, Why don't you do that? And stepping back, just a little bit more broadly, really again to emphasize um, that Supervisor Rice and I as a subcommittee really mm -hmm. stand ready to continue working with staff, continue working with the community, including a couple of additional public forums coming up uh, to further uh, delve into a couple of these issues as, as we'll go through. So item one on acquisition and preservation um, absolutely, as stated before, I do believe we should bolster that effort through um, some outside professional staffing to help in locating uh, potential um, resources we can add to that program. Um, landlord partnership number two, absolutely, let's enhance with $135,000. Uh, continue the great work uh, going forward on that. Number three, I agree we should delete voluntary rent guidelines. Um, I don't think we're going to get any argument either from landlords or tenants on that one. Uh, item four, mandatory mediation. Uh, I personally feel we should continue to at least pursue that as an option. We heard some parameters it could include, for example, if a uh, rent increases for uh, over 5%, it could automatically trigger uh, mandatory mediation to get both sides to the table. It could also uh, go beyond just an issue of rent and toward other issues. Um, just cause, I think we heard some good perspectives on that uh, tonight. One thing I will note on that, just so we're clear, is in most cases uh, where there is just a just cause ordinance, it's uh, accompanied by rent control. Um, the vast majority of jurisdictions do not have a standalone just cause ordinance for the simple reason that it, um, the landlord can ultimately try to create a situation uh, to force a tenant out by jacking up the rent. So the issue of unintended consequences is something we're all mindful of in doing that. Here's what I would propose, though. Let's keep it on the list. Um, we have examples in other communities 
where it was either recently enacted or has been on the books for a while, is it working? Is it making a difference? Is it creating unintended consequences? How does it work with other existing protections? As we heard, there are strong state laws on the books now toward retaliatory eviction, but it sounds like um, many folks feel that those are hard to enforce. Um, what are the barriers to that, and, and how can we address that uh, locally as well? Um, on that note, and I get the feeling hearing from some of our tenants this evening, do they know their rights? Um, do they know that they can pursue legal options that exist? Do landlords know that they're abiding the law? So one issue as well as a community is can we be doing a better job on um, education Secondly, can we be doing a better job on enforcement, um, whether it be related to code violations um, as a county, and again, hopefully working with our uh, cities and towns as well, uh, and also enforcement on retaliation and the like. Um, again, I, I think uh, we heard a lot tonight on Just Cause. Let's move forward in looking at the case studies, yeah. looking at how it fits in, and uh, perhaps even get more input on that issue. Second unit amnesty, um, I'm prepared to go with staff on that, that uh, given our additional uh, work on ADU and JDU, um, that may not be necessary. And finally, on um, number seven, housing overlay designation, absolutely feel that we need to revisit that issue. Um, the fact of the matter is is that uh, designation has existed for a number of years now with no affordable units being uh, created at all under it. Um, so what do we need to do Im to improve it? Staff has come forward with a couple of recommendations. I'm not sure if those are necessarily the way to go, but again, let's keep this on the list and the housing uh, subcommittee can continue to look at that. So I would say continue work on uh, mandatory mediation, just cause, and HOD. All right, I'm going to call on the other committee member, Supervisor Wright. I, let's see, a uh, couple things. One, um, really appreciate the folks, uh, everyone who came up today and hearing your personal stories uh, and or observations as members of, a of the community. Um, we did start this conversation here at the county level some almost two years ago, 18 months ago, and though it seems like it has been a long time that we've been working on this, um, as was articulated today, we are making some progress. These aren't easy decisions, and there are nuances around especially um, uh, the things like just cause or rent stab stabilization, there's different forms. Um, it's been, they, both those kinds of programs have been implemented in different ways in different communities with different kinds of results. But I think bottom line for Marin County at this point, um, as for many other communities in the Bay Area and in California, when you have a situation of basically functional zero vacancy rates, all the pressure is on the tenants, and the tenants are bearing all the weight of, um, of some really uh, critical life stuff. And um, those are the stories we heard, and that is, frankly, why we've all, we started this conversation. So with regards to the individual programs, I think we have to continue with the acquisition, preservation, um, our efforts there. We're making some progress, not as much as I would like, and I do think we should. Um, I'm all for putting some more money into and bringing on in some assistance towards project development, uh, performa development, um, and actually I think we have to really build up on the ownership side, potential owners. Who can we partner with? We have resources. We have the will, and I think we have the community behind um, that will stand up and get behind um, acquisition preservation efforts and hopefully skipping to the end if we are able to work on this housing overlay designation um, so that it results in potentially more projects coming forward 
um, I think we've got community that will get behind that. So um, those are the two bookends. Uh, landlord partnership program, yes, let's redirect that, uh, those funds that we're going to go towards the voluntary rental guidelines or anywhere else into that program. It's been uh, paying dividends in a host of ways. Thank you, Supervisor Conley, for leading that effort. Um, I, I think we have to, I think we need to keep mandatory mediation and just cause on the table. Um, I think we have more to hear and we have more to learn. And um, so I would uh, hope that the rest of the board agrees that um, our subcommittee should continue to work on both those items. And frankly, I think they probably, if we do either, we probably should consider doing both. But again, the devil's in the details and the nuance, and things have to be carefully crafted. And uh, I think we should try to do this right. It may not be perfect, but we can strive for right. I think that's about it. On the second unit amnesty, we can revive that at any time. So um, I would go along with staff recommendations, but I would also say to the degree that we have resources to help support folks who are interested in developing uh, ADUs or JDUs, um, I think that's also a good place to put some uh, energy and resources. And you spoke to Housing Overlay in the beginning, correct? Yeah, that yes. was my okay, book. Yeah. Right. Okay, Supervisor Rodelli. I, yes, I want to thank Supervisor Conley and Supervisor Rice for their work on the subcommittee. Also want to mention CDA staff, in particular Lily and Debbie, for their work. Um, in particular, I, I'm in support in general, but I'll go through them individually. Uh, the acquisition program, I think, is and adding staff and expertise is a great idea. But I don't want you to forget that West Marin real estate market is really unique, and we may need to have someone diff different for that area. Things happen very quickly out there, and if we're going to have opportunities, we need to be able to move quickly, and I think someone that knows, knows the local market is really important. Uh, I agree with the landlord partnership uh, enhancement, but again, I'd like to recognize CLAM's real community rental program. If that's successful, I think it should also get additional funding. Um, understand the <coughs> voluntary rent guidelines will be deleted, and I'm okay with that. I agree with the mandatory mediation, and I'd like to actually see that maybe move up to be a priority simply because uh, while we're discussing the just cause evictions, it could be a good mechanism in the interim to help with some of those issues. Um, I'm also very supportive of a just cause eviction ordinance. I think it's, it's, it's needed badly in Marin, but it has to also fit Marin's needs, and I think I trust the subcommittee and, and Lily and, and Debbie can work on that and come back. Uh, hopefully soon with a just cause eviction program that suits Marin and will work in Marin. Um, the second unit amnesty program, I'm, I call this just postponing this because I want a program if we do have it to work and, and I think there's some obstacles that we're trying to work on with environmental health and maybe other zoning and other regulations that need to be worked out first. So I just uh, refer to that as being postponed and uh, like it when it's needed, when it will be successful to bring it back. Um, the HOD, I'm quite happy with that. I do think we need to revisit that. That's the one way that we answer that concern of, of we're not building anything, opportunity to maybe build something. Um, I also wanted to mention several of the speakers tonight referred to our county employees. And I wanted to mention that sometimes we forget to recognize county employees face similar struggles with affordability. Our recruitment and our retaining employees <coughs> affected by the lack of affordable housing. To address these issues, I've been discussing with the CAO's office the possibility of a county rental assistance program. In addition, we've talked about an employee or countywide first-time homeowners down payment assistance program similar to other counties. Both are in really early discussions and most likely will be sent to the labor subcommittee for additional discovery. So we've made good progress. It's a good report, but there's much to do. And I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and sharing your vision with us. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor C. So thanks very much. And you know, there's absolutely no question that we have a housing supply problem in the County of Marin. But to me, that does not in any way excuse the extraordinarily large increases in rent that our uh, residents have been suffering and that it's making it very challenging for all of us as employers to retain and recru recruit our employees and that is obviously exacerbating our traffic problem. I think one of our speakers, David Schoenbrunn, said it best 
when he said the aim of just cause eviction ordinance is to restrain the predators. I think that's absolutely right. And I think the same is true for man mandatory mediation. Um, and I would note um, that the, I believe the suggested trigger uh, for mandatory mediation was a 5% rent increase. I think that's appropriate. It was not a 10% rent increase as some of our speakers thought. I think both of those steps are ones that, uh, that the mandatory mediation and just cause uh, are important steps for us to take. And I think, you know, I'll note that in our staff report, I really appreciated the amount of information and data in the staff report. And there's a table that indicates five jurisdictions in California that have just cause ordinances without rent, a rent stab stabilization program. That's Emeryville, Glendale, Maywood, San Diego, and Union City. I don't think we have a good sense of how successful a just cause ordinance can be without uh, rent stabilization, but I think it's really an important place to start. And so I'm not going to go through all seven of the recommendations individually because I, I support all of the recommendations by staff. And I really look forward to staff uh, working in these various areas with the full engagement and uh, under the direction of our board subcommittee. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Um, all right, so last but not least, maybe. Thank you, staff. I, I, I want really to, to mention the mandatory mediation and the just cause. This is, a, this is a thorny issue, and I think that's the reason why it's been hard for the supervisors and the subcommittee to really grapple with it. It's been on that table for a long time, and I think we need to bring that forward, and we need to say, we either want to do this under these conditions or recommend to us that we don't. But I think it's really time to look at that, especially when we see what's happening and, and the people that are hurting uh, in this county. Um, very supportive of revaluation of the housing overlay. It, people who've said the lack of supply is, is what's really at, the, at the, the, the bottom of the problem. Well, that, this housing overlay has got to be changed so that we can look at providing new affordable housing in this county. And I think we've got to be strong enough when there is a proposal for affordable housing that we all come and stand up and say this is the right thing to do. It's, uh, it's trauma time and, and we need to be very, very serious um, about this issue. Um, and um, certainly I, I support uh, adding a staff person. Um, I think uh, the workshop for the housing overlay is the next step, and I think that's a great idea. Um, and um, I think that's, um, yes, I, I wrote down the 5%. That's still a lot when you're a tenant, but <laughs> at least if it's capped, that's better than nothing. So I want to thank I want to thank everyone who came here, everyone who who stayed and gave your thoughts. It we heard it, and it was powerful what we heard. So if staff ha has any questions about what the supervisors have said, no <laughs> questions. All right. So then I want to thank everyone for coming, and we are adjourned. Yes. Do you oh, want us oh, to oh, take it? We need to thank you, Diane. Approve the.